honored and I have to tell you guys, when I first found out about this, when I saw Gloria Stein will be introducing you, I did a little dance, I think. <laughs> um, I got her from a chair. And the reason for that is that I've looked up to Ms. Steinem ever since I knew what feminism was. It's not every day that you get to be introduced by an icon, so forgive me if I pinch myself at some point to remind myself I'm not dreaming. I'm really grateful for the introduction as well because a lot of times it's hard for me to think about how I should introduce myself I feel like I have to choose somehow because of the wide range of causes that I support or roles that I embody as a student, writer, teacher, and activist. So a defining moment for me was when I went to a um, philosophy course at Stanford over the summer for three weeks. And we were all in class introducing ourselves. I looked around the room, opened my mouth, and said, I'm a feminist. My convictions didn't start with finding a way to introduce myself, of course. They started gradually and in some unlikely places. You see, like a lot of you, I really love princesses. I love their fancy tiaras and elaborate dresses, their convoluted names and inherited power. And this could have really easily gone in the other direction. The influence of too many princesses getting rescued by Prince Charming's on white horses could have taught me this image of feminine as weak, except that I loved history too. So in the pages of books, I did find my role models, just maybe not the role models that most people would expect. I found Elizabeth I infinitely cooler than Cinderella because being imprisoned in the Tower of London while evading the possibility that your sister might call off with her head seems a lot tougher than throwing down a glass slipper. The lesson that being a bookworm taught me was that for every Snow White or Sleeping Beauty or Cinderella, there was a Catherine the Great or Joan of Arc or Eleanor Roosevelt. And when I started writing my own stories, I determined that there would have to be some characters who didn't fit the stereotype of this good little girl. That came pretty naturally to me because it was around the same time that I decided I was a feminist. But I wonder why those three little words, I'm a feminist, can be so hard for girls and guys our age sometimes to say. When it's said, it's often followed by an apologetic qualifier but I still like when guys hold doors for me. Or we hear something about feminism being used in a pick and choose way, like I'm a feminist when it comes to this, or disavowed entirely. I wouldn't call myself a feminist. But then followed by an acknowledgement of current wrongs in society and a belief in inequality for women, or in inequality for women, that basically makes the speaker a feminist in all but name. Be honest, you've probably done it at some point or seen it done. We shouldn't ever feel like we have to qualify, deny, or apologize for our belief in what's right, equality. We can stop being scared of feminism. We can make it cool, not scary or weird to say, I'm a feminist. In Iowa during the Republican primary, some of you guys might have heard of this, there was this pledge going around asking candidates to affirm their family values. I would love for a feminism pledge to go around Congress. That might sound kind of radical. People might ask, well, feminism, isn't that about being a scary man-hating lady in a big shoulder-padded power suit? <laughs> Not quite. According to the dictionary, feminism is advocating for social, economic, political, and legal rights for women equal to those of men. Definitions have power. Because when you tell someone that's what feminism is, they sit up and say, well, I guess then I'm a feminist. If we all take this step of affirming the importance of feminism, it will have a huge impact. The people who will ultimately have the most change, who should carry the feminist movement onwards, are us, young people. We need to make sure that today's boys and girls know at least as much about the lives of Susan B. Anthony or Gloria Steinem as they do about Kim Kardashian or Snooki. That's a vision of the girls' state of the union that I, as a teenage girl, hope to see. One where equality, respect, and fairness for all are more than ideals for the nation, but words embodied each and every day. Yet this vision may seem elusive in the present day. Talking to my peers, opinion seems to be split. Some are well informed and know that the work of feminism isn't over. But others point to how far we've come and question the necessity of the movement's continuance. And society has, in many ways, conditioned us to think that way. 
with artificial constructions of token girl power, yet excessive segregation and limitation in the merchandise we're offered, media we consume, and more. If we go on a shopping trip, just taking a jaunt down the toys aisle tells us that something is wrong. We can tell really quickly what's for girls and what's for boys. The boys get Star Wars figurines and superheroes, and the girls get Barbies with feet made for high heels, or Disney princesses sitting pretty and waiting for Prince Charming to rescue them. Now you wander down to the magazine section, I'm sure you guys have all been there before, and you might look at the selection for teenage girls. Seventeen, Teen Vogue, Cosmo Girl, Girls Life, celebrities, gossip, hair, makeup advice, relationships, how to get flat abs on every cover. What more could a teen girl want? Now you've come to the clothing and shoes section. The high heels get higher and higher, and in the juniors clothing section, almost every bra is a push-up. You wonder why. This department store experience might be virtual, but the merchandise within it isn't. As a five-year-old, I had those proportionally incorrect dolls. As a teenager, I see magazines marketed to us that value beauty over brains, and I see clothes that sell too much on the basis of less is more, especially if it's lacy and pink. I don't think that the women I look up to got to where they are now because of Barbie-esque figures. I think it took smarts and persistence and hard work. These aren't the traits that are emphasized on store shelves with merchandise for girls. And misrepresentation of girls and women continues through adulthood. On TV, we see the exploits of the real housewives of insert any city here, stereotypical cat fighting. And on Jersey Shore, we're entertained by all the exploits of Nicole Plizzy, a.k.a. Snooki. The question I ask is, is it right that Snooki, who I hope will never be a serious influence in government or policy, <laughs> has more name recognition than Valerie Jarrett, who's the president's senior advisor? Who would you rather have your daughters looking up to? We teenage girls hear a lot of mixed messages. We hear things like, inside beauty is more important than outside beauty. Love who you are. Be yourself. And then we hear things like Representative Jim Sensenbrenner discouraging Michelle Obama's healthy eating campaign by saying, she has a large posterior herself, end quote. Is this an appropriate comment for anyone, man or woman, Democrat or Republican, to make? Hillary Clinton once said, if I want to knock a story off the front page, I just change my hairstyle. Michelle Obama's outfits are headline news items. Is this how you would want to be evaluated all the time, by your outward appearance? Step out the door and everything you wear, how you look, whether you're wearing makeup or not, scrutinized. If there is any silver lining to growing up in this environment that tells us that appearance is everything, it's this. Maybe we should know from reading enough issues of Seventeen or Cosmo Girl how to make something look good. But instead of using lipstick or foundation on our skin, we can use feminism to give society a makeover. Making over society is what the Women's Media Center is doing. Girls are taking action. The Spark Summit petition asking that Seventeen Magazine stop photoshopping girls and provide girls with images of real girls led to Seventeen vowing to change their ways. High school students Emma Axelrod, Sammy Siegel, and Alina Summers successfully pushed for a female moderator in the presidential debates, as you guys know. And Emma is a graduate of the Women's Media Center Progressive Girls' Voices training. This kind of action is grassroots, it's effective, and it's needed. You see, by staying silent, apologizing for speaking up, or criticizing those who do, we're falling into a waiting for Prince Charming trap. The idea that someone else will come along and do the heavy lifting to solve our problems and rescue us. But by fighting for ourselves, not being afraid to speak up, and using media to amplify our voices, we can do the rescuing ourselves because progress doesn't work the way of fairy tales. Progress is a story we ourselves get to write. There are girls who aren't waiting to write this story. They're taking action now. As I close my remarks, it's worth remembering on this International Day of the Girl that in some other countries, girls are risking their very lives to do so. You know now about the story of 14-year-old Malala Yousafzai, an activist for girls' education in Pakistan, shot and grievously injured by the Taliban for her courageous work. She is still fighting for her life in a hospital. 
What I find uplifting about this story, aside from the tremendous bravery of one girl, is the solidarity of her community. Men, women, and children condemned the hateful, cowardly action of her attacker. And this quote stuck with me as I watched the nightly news last night. A girl from Malala's hometown saying something along the lines of, for every girl they try to silence, there will be thousands of us angry and ready to speak up. Are we angry? Yes, yes. we are. Are we ready to speak up? Yes, yes we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> Thank you.